Amen. <laughs> I just love, uh, I love coming to church on Sundays. Yeah. I love coming on Wednesdays too, but you know why I love coming? is because it's family. I know some of y'all are like, well, I don't really like my family and I don't like this. No. <laughs> no. There's something about family, like sometimes you don't necessarily pick your family. They're the ones that God placed in your life. But you learn so much from your family members and you grow. And when we come into God's house, we always grow. We never leave the same way that we came in. That's the law of worship. And uh, what God has put on my heart and Pastor Dana's heart the, for the past, oh, it's been a couple weeks now, and we kicked it off last week, was we, we started to, to kind of lay a foundation, and really it's the lifestyle of any Christian, any believer, and it's basically a life of faith. Right. Right. Amen? Uh, a lot of times people like to take this, word and they try to make this word fit into their understanding they try to make it fit into their degrees and their letters at the end of their name and stuff like that and and that's nice that's nice that they do that i i think that you should increase in knowledge and increase in understanding but don't ever limit it or stop and not allow this word to change and revolutionize your life you can read one scripture over and over. I've been, you know, uh, serving the Lord for 30 years now, you know. I've been married, you know, 25 years and known her a little bit longer than that. And, and with all that, every time I read the word, I get something different out of it. But there's times when I do read the word and I don't get anything different. It's the same thing. And you know why? I'm not reading it in faith. There's something about reading it in faith. Now, if you're married, how many people in here are married? Do we have any married people in here? Good. Good, yeah. Good. One, two excited married couples. That's good. And they've been married more than five years. More than seven. More than the seven-year itch, you know. So, so they have some credibility. But there's something about, you know, I've been married to my wife for, for some time now, and there's others in here that have been married as long or if not longer than we have. And I'm still learning things about my wife. And she's still learning things about me. She's like, I never would have picked that out for you. You know, like something that I'm wearing or something that I do or, or something like that. And why is that? I'm alive. She's alive. You're always going to find out something more. And if you have it, that's your fault. You know why your marriage isn't as good as it could be? Because you're not doing something. Now, granted, it takes two to tango. It takes two to tango. But you can do your part, and it's the same thing with this word. This word will come alive to you if you will read it with faith in your heart, and it will show you something. This word is alive and should come alive to you. Amen? Now, we know that God knows the end from the beginning, does he not? And since he does know the end from the beginning, did you, do you think that he has things planned for you? Yeah. Do you think that the things that he has planned for you are good? Yeah. Okay, I just want to kind of establish something real quick. So, so if he does and he has things planned, do you think that um, his calendar is important? Yeah. His yeah. timeline is important? Yeah. Um, I, I've been, you know in business off and on uh, for many years and there's always different time zones in the business that I've been in for 20 plus years and so you know they're like hey okay we're going to hop on a zoom call it's going to be at such and such a time I'm like okay such and such a time central such and such a time eastern or pacific because <laughs> there's a big difference between the times and I'm left waiting uh, or or maybe I'm late to it or something like that because of the right time. And so we as Western culture, we love our Gregorian calendar. We love our Valentine's Day. We like our Labor Day's coming up. People are excited about that because, like, yeah, we don't have to go to church that weekend. We're going to go somewhere. No, 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 <laughs> no. no. 
And, I, and I'm thankful for the calendars, but God's calendar is the one that we need to be following. And it just so happened that today is the very first day of Elul in God's calendar. Did you know that? Yeah. And now here's what's significant about that. This day of Elul has many meanings to it, uh, and I'm going to read some of them to you. But one of the things that's very significant about it is the month right before Rosh Hashanah. You know what Rosh Hashanah is, don't you? I mean, we all know about that. That's the high point of the year. It's the head of the year, the new year. And man, I'm telling you, there are some amazing things that are coming for the following year. Um, but one of the things about here is this Gregorian calendar that we're a part of, this year's not over. Everybody's like, well, I kind of wish it was Christmas. I saw some Christmas ribbon at Walmart the other day. I mean, that was the craziest thing ever. It's not even Halloween yet, and there's already Christmas ribbon now. I mean, the world's already like, hey, let's just fast forward and kind of get through this year. No, people, people of faith, people that believe God should have an expectation that there's still time left. Amen? Now, now the month of Elul, I had some things I wanted to, to read you before we get into this because it has everything to do with what we're going to talk about today. We're setting a foundation. We're building something. And this is the lifestyle of a believer. And you know what the lifestyle of a believer it is? is one of miracles, signs, and wonders in everything you do. You should be walking in the miraculous. You should be walking in the supernatural naturally. It's not something that's condemning or, or like, oh, you're not good. No, it is something that needs to be unveiled to you. Okay? So with, the, with today being the first month of Elul, I want to read some things to you. Here's one of the things that it means. It means this. This is this for Jewish people. No, we're, we're Messianic Jews, okay? But it says, the king is in the field. And you're like, well, that's kind of cool. Well, here's what that means. Back then, the king was in the palace. You couldn't go see him. And if you did, you had to be by appointment. Well, this is a time that the king came down into a field, and everyone could that wanted to meet with him could. Thank God for Jesus that now we can meet with him anytime and every time we want. Amen? And so that's good. But here's another thing is this is the month to, uh, to uh, really have the eye of the needle. And you guys know, you've heard that before. Jesus talked about the eye of the needle. Really, it's a time of throwing things off. Things that have carried you, things that have been weighing you down, it's a time to throw those things off. Now, the eye of the needle, what that was, it was a smaller gate within the big gate of a city. And what, what happened is they would take these camels and they would have to take all of the things off of the camel and they would open the eye of the needle and the camel would crawl through to the other side and then have all of the things put back on so they could go and take them to market. What the Lord is saying is during this month is throw all of those things off that have been weighing you down. Come on, somebody. This is also a month to run into the tower of the Lord. His name is a strong tower. It's a place of refuge, a place of restoration, a place of solace. It is a haven of time like a city of refuge from the ravages of life. That's good. This is a month where God wants to meet us in a special way and share a special time of intimacy with him. This is a month that we should draw near to him. Hebrews 4 says, let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace that we could obtain mercy and find grace for this help in a time of need. That's what's happening right now. I'm going to read something to you. And then we're going to get into this message. But this, this is something that we need to hear. Because this is what God has already set up for us. Don't you want to know what's already prepared for you? So listen to this. The Jews call this month the eye of the needle month. And they do this because it's to give God the eye of the needle in your life. I kind of talked about that. Making a place for him. Even only if it's a small time. A small piece of time. Because that time that you give wholly and completely to him, he can pour out his love and his faithfulness to you. And during the lull, God is saying, open up for me this eye of the needle, and I will open for you the most expansive corridors of his great hall. 
He is saying, I don't demand that you change your entire life this month. I ask that you open up for me the eye of the needle and find a place in your life that you can totally dedicate to him and let him prove himself to you. So ask yourself this during this month, during this time. What part of my life can I put completely into God's hands? Now, for some of us, we're like, well, I already have everything put into his hands. This is a time to draw nearer, to draw closer. Amen? So what have you been worrying over that you could just entrust him? Look at those cares and anxieties that have drained your strength and cast those totally and completely on him. Amen? So, so during this month, um, we're learning about the unseen realm. We're going to be continue learning it into the next month and the next month because there's so much to a life of faith. And, you know, we've kind of gone through some scriptures, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get to the foundation scriptures that we did last week. But I want to open up this week with a new one because it's something that just jumped off the page at me. Have you ever had something just jump off the page at you? Yeah, just now. So if you could turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 1. <clears throat> and we'll look at this in verse 5. And it says here, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in this last time. So let me let me back up. Let me look at this again. Now, who, I know we kind of jumped into the this middle of a statement. This word who, that means we. So everybody say me. Say it like you mean it. Me. So he's saying he's talking to you. You are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation. So it's God's power that is working in your life, but it's your faith. Not God's faith. It's your faith. It's God's power. See, it's not something that you could do. It's his power. It's his ability. And then it's your faith. So look at it this way. Every time that we, we kind of talked about this last week. Every time that Jesus was out doing something, when every miracle you saw, it was always someone's faith that got them healed. Do you concur? So he would say, oh, the, your faith, her faith, never seen such great faith. The woman with the issue of blood, we know the story from last week that she heard and then she said and said and said if I can touch the hem of his garment now she had to throw some things off she threw off that garment that said that she was unclean and she no longer said the word unclean because in public she would have to say unclean so she threw off her old identity and picked up the new identity in Christ Jesus and notice that, that she even you know, when she was in there and she touched him, Jesus, you know, he's getting pressed. And it'd be like, I don't know who is famous anymore because I don't really keep up with who's famous and who's not famous. Um, right now, my wife says that that uh, Austin Butler is uh, the Elvis guy. He's very famous. And, and Baz, whatever his last name is, he's very famous. And people crowd them all over the place. But you can imagine that if it was some popular group or or person they're getting crammed by fans all the way around and then so imagine that's Jesus walking and people are just cramming all around him trying to get something from him and he goes who touched me he's like they're like seriously his disciples were like Jesus who what do you, why, why are you saying who touched you well see he felt something different in that touch he felt some power it says he felt power leave him he felt faith leave him. He felt the power of God leave him. You and I are carriers of the power of God. Say, I'm a carrier. You know, we have all these different variants right now of the COVID strain and this and that and that and blah, 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 blah. I even see people still walking around with masks. And I'm like, these people are just straight crazy. For, I'm not going to even say forgive me because I'm not apologizing. Because that mask doesn't even uh, fight the microns of the size of the variant. It's just, it's a false safety. But see, there's something about them. They think that they have a safety in something that can't even provide protection. 
But we have a safety, we have a confidence, we have something that's even greater. The blood of Jesus. It'll never fail you, it'll never let you down. But there's going to be a test, there's going to be a trial, there's going to be a fight to your faith. Don't shut me down because I'm preaching good. Whenever God gives you a promise, it says that immediately the enemy comes to try to steal that promise from your heart. And so sometimes you get frustrated. Sometimes you're worried and you don't even know why you, uh, things aren't been working for you. Well, it's because that word did not stay planted and produce something. It may have gotten planted in your heart, but maybe the soil in your heart dried up. Dried up by the cares of this world, according to the Bible. But you know what's interesting about, about uh, the soil that gets dried up? All it needs is a little water. All it needs is a little word. All it needs is a little Holy Ghost. Just one dose of the Holy Ghost. It's not enough for me. <laughs> See, I wanted to kind of talk to you about faith this morning because I am of the opinion, not even opinion, I am of the truth, that this year's not over. I, I mean, you know, I know that, that, you know, the week's over, but this is a new week. Today's the beginning of a new week. So really today, you should have a fresh expectation. Something good's going to happen for you. And that wasn't Joel Osteen, that was Oral Roberts. Okay. <laughs> Like, you can get mad at them all you want, but don't throw in the towel. Don't give up. Don't let go of your faith. And people are like, well, yeah, I really don't need any faith. Well, you're not really believing for anything then. And I was telling the worship team this morning, this is what God's been putting on my heart. You are, according to the word of God, you are a king and a priest. Say that. Say, I'm a king and a priest. That means you're royalty. Say, I'm royalty. You're royalty. That means you should act different. You should treat things differently. Now, Mephibosheth, he was royalty, and there was an uprising and a, and a thing. But then David said, hey, is there not still a lineage of royalty? And they go, well, yeah, there's Mephibosheth, but he, his, uh, his legs are broken, and he, he's living in low Debar. And the, the Lord just kind of talks to me that way, and he says, stop letting people lower the bar in their faith. Are you lowering the bar in your faith because it's too hard to believe for something? Are you lowering the bar in your marriage because your spouse is being hard to deal with? Are you lowering the bar in your, your health or your healing because it just seems tough? Well, I've been believing God for 20 years and it's still there. Maybe the Holy Spirit's been telling you to make changes, but you don't want to. You just want that little dabble, do you? Man, just give me the drive through miracle. Come on. No. See, the, here's the thing. You know why God doesn't give the drive through miracle sometimes? I love suddenlies. I'm all about suddenlies. I'm thankful. I've had suddenlies happen in my life. But you know what that suddenly took? A whole lot of time before the suddenly. A whole lot of wanting to quit, wanting to give up, wanting to say, what's the point? Screaming in the middle of the night at the top of my lungs. When I first got married, we, you know, God had been blessing us one thing after another. Boom, 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 boom. And we were in this brand new house that we built that we didn't even qualify for. It was a God thing. It was a God miracle. And I get up in the middle of the night and I'm like screaming. My wife's like, this guy's going crazy. I'm screaming like, there's got to be more! Like some dramatic movie, you know. And you know what? It was a cry of my heart, but it was also my flesh being a big baby. So many times what we do is, is uh, we allow the flesh to get in the way. And you know what the biggest hindrance of God's plan for your life is? Your plan. See, God's saying, oh, I got something new for you. I want to show you something new. But you've got to let go of your plan. You've got to let go of, of your idea and let him speak to you. This is where we start believing again. 
I'm starting to believe again in areas that I let lay dormant. You're like, well, you're the pastor. I'm also human. There's always an area in your life that you can come up in. God wants you to come back up in some areas, and there's some areas that you were at once at a high point, and now you're just not even there at all anymore. God says, I want you to come back to that place, but I want, I'm going to bring you up even higher. Amen? See, the, the, the issue with faith is we think that faith is something that we can see. The Word says that faith is the things that you can't see. Right? We read that last week. It's just, it's really in our, in our culture here at this church, it's common sense. Everyone knows that. But let's just look at it again, okay? Let's look at it again. Let's turn to 2 Corinthians 4. We kind of went over this a little bit. Uh, it says this. It says, since we consider or we look not at the things which are what? What are we not supposed to look at? Four people. What are we not supposed to look at? The scene. We're not supposed to look at the scene, but the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary. Everybody say it's temporary. temporary. The things that you're looking at, good or bad, they're temporary. They're subject to change, but they're not going to change on their own. You're going to have a part to play with it. But it says the things which are not seen are eternal. So we're not supposed to look at the scene. What are we supposed to look at? The unseen, the eternal things. But see, here's the thing is, in our mind as believers, we think sometimes that's foolish. Well, no, I'm just being real. No, you're being real foolish. The word says you're being foolish. As a matter of fact, God says that he chooses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. It's foolish to jump up and down and shout when everything's going wrong in your life. For us, for my wife and I, when this was years, like back in 2008 or something, it was foolish for me to jump up and down and dance in the Holy Ghost when they were about to foreclose on our house. But we knew it was God talking to us. And as we did, God did some supernatural things. And for no reason whatsoever, they took it off of that docket. And the, the um, mortgage company said, hey, we're going to forgive you of $35,000. And we're going to allow you to be back in good standing. How does that happen? By faith. It's faith. Did you know the word foolish in the Greek is the word morose? That's where we get the word moron. And so the things that look moronic to the world are the things that are powerful to God. But here's another thing that seems that what's foolish for a believer or someone that would be foolish that's a believer is someone that cannot see heavenly things the way heaven operates see it's not about getting things you know mark 6 30 or matthew 6 33 says seek first the kingdom of god god's way of doing things and all these things will be added unto you doesn't mean seek the things it means seek his way of doing things so don't be foolish according to the bible start looking at things as as heaven sees them here's what a foolish person is a foolish person lives by their own devices a foolish person lives by their own understanding well i just don't know if i agree with that scripture well you're foolish well you're taking that scripture out of context you're getting conned by the text no i've got three other ones that will parallel with that a foolish person is bound by their own pleasures, their own economy, their own pain, their own consequences. But we, as people of faith, know that God has a better plan. Say it with me. God has a better plan. Now, now we know he has a better plan, but it seems challenging, does it not? 
I'm going to unlock some things. I'm going to show you a key today that's going to help you, and it's going to show you how you can please God because it says that we can't please him if we're not in faith. It says that it's hard to please him. No. What does it say? Impossible. It's impossible to please God without faith. Now, granted, the, the, if you receive the, his salvation, if you receive his grace, you're there, you're in his family, but if you want to please him, it's going to take some faith. Amen? And so here's what, here's what it is. That, that, that the first thing we've got to do is we've got to get over ourselves. Pastor Dana said it uh, a month or so ago, mind your business, right? You mind your own business. 1 Corinthians 9, 27 says, put your bodies under subjection. Well, nobody likes that. Did you know they don't even call diets diet anymore? Because it's a negative connotation. It's like die with the letter T at the end of it. Now it's meal plans. <laughs> Macros. Right? No, you're still dieting. You're still putting your body under subjection. You're saying, okay, my flesh really wants this chocolate toffee treat, but I know it's going to add some pounds where I don't need them. Now, but see, the word says this, Romans 8, 13 says, if you live according to the flesh, you're going to die. But if you live according to the spirit, you put to death the deeds of the body and you will live. See, the enemy of your faith is your flesh. Go, go look at, at, you know, little Johnny. Sweet little kid, love him, cute as a button. He had some keys earlier, and uh, his, his brother or sister had took the keys from him, and you would have thought that you killed him. Right? Ah! Ah! Can't even talk that well, but you knew he was unhappy. End of the world. Keys gone. He can't even drive yet. But those were his keys. See, that's how your flesh is. Mine, 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 mine. It's like a dog with an old bone. They don't want it until someone else does. That's how your flesh is. You've got to put to death your flesh. And here in, in, in churchdom, submission or subjection, putting your body under is almost like a dirty word because of all the different things that have happened over time. But see, if you will put your flesh under and allow your spirit to uh, be aligned with what this word says about you, you're going to come out on top every time. Amen? See, faith has an expectation. Hebrews 11.1, 1, we know it. We're going to look at it again. Hebrews 11.1 1 says this, now faith. Everybody say now faith. Now. Not yesterday's faith. Not tomorrow's faith. Now faith. That means you're expecting right now. It's the substance of things hoped for. We know the Amplified last week. It said the title deed, the confirmation, it's yours of things that you confidently expect. That's what hope means. Not a worldly hope, but confidently expect. It's the evidence of things you cannot see. That's what faith is, right? So faith is an expectation. The New Living Translation says this. It says faith is the reality of what we hope for and the evidence of what we can't see. So if you're expecting something and you're happy about it, just like we talked about Amazon last week, you can see when it's 10 stops away. You're like, oh, I better stay around. It could be here any minute. You schedule your whole day around a blue truck. But you're expecting, and it changes your attitude. But then we walk up in church, and we say, hey, man, how you doing? Oh, I'm good. I'm expecting. Really? We don't even use the word expecting nowadays because, oh, that's not cool. I don't care if it's cool or not. You need to be expecting for something. Expecting for your health to be better. Expecting for your marriage to be better. Expecting to get promotion at your job because you are royalty. Expecting to get new clients, new customers, whatever it is for you. We need to be expecting. Say, I'm expecting. Well, you know, well, I don't really feel healed. 
if you're expecting to get healed, you're not going to get healed. But if you're expecting that the miracle is manifesting right now, see, that's the thing. Is remember, faith calls those things that aren't as though they are. Now, now, you don't go, oh, I don't have pain. I don't have pain. No, what you do say is like, by his stripes, I am healed. So you call what it's not. Like right now, my foot hurts. I've got a nice bunion on the side. Thanks, my grandmother and my mother. That's just a genetic thing. It's like the bone's twisted and turning out to the side. I've got like a talon on the side of my foot. It's really cool. Not really. But I don't go around, oh, oh, oh. No, I thank you, Father, I'm healed. See, I'm speaking what it's not. That's what faith does. And people are like, oh, you got to be careful about that. You got to watch out. Don't be calling those things. Okay, stay broke. Stay sick. Stay in your bad relationship. No. See, God wants you to have more. Amen? We know that it's impossible to, to please him without faith. So why do we think that we can Did you know that you're redeemed? In fact, the Bible says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. We got any redeemed people in here? Yeah. What are you redeemed from? Curse of the law. Galatians 3. In fact, pull it up. Galatians 3 says this, that you have been redeemed from the curse of the law, for it's written, cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. What do you redeem from? The curse of the law. What was the curse of the law? You're going to have to work your tail off and barely get by. You're going to have to struggle. You're going to have to deal with sickness. You're going to have to deal with plagues. You're going to have to deal with all these things because you chose not to serve the Lord. And really, actually, it goes back into the Adam and the fall so that the, the God of this world is the one that's been over us. But thank God for the blood of Jesus Thank God for his grace and his mercy. There's nothing we could do to earn it or deserve it. We just have to receive it. So I receive my healing. I receive my provision. I receive favor. I, I, a lot of times what I'll say is like, I receive that restoration. I thank you that my youth is renewed like the eagles. <laughs> When I wake up in the morning at 4.30 to go to the gym and I get out of bed and everything's cracking like I stepped on a bunch of bubble paper, but it's my tendons and my joints. I'm like, oh, I'm not going to wake my wife up. And everything's stiff. And I'm like, oh, I thank you that my youth is renewed like the eagles. <laughs> and then I work it out. And I definitely don't feel the age that I am. I feel about 20 years younger. What I'm trying to tell you is faith is actually easier than you think. But there's a fight to it. If there wasn't a fight to it, it wouldn't say in the Bible, fight the good fight of faith. Now, has anybody ever been in a good fight before? Yeah, a couple of us. Why was it good? It was hard. You lost. Did you lose? Oh, you won. You won. Faith is a good fight. The fight is a good fight when you win. Even, what? Even Stephen? No, that's never good. That's horrible. That's, we don't kiss our sister here. No, <laughs> I'm kidding. You're like, what are you talking about? Sports terminology. Here's the thing. It's a good fight when you win. Now, I, I love watching the UFC. I grew up wrestling, and, and I boxed in college. And I, and I lost in wrestling, and I've lost in boxing. And those fights were never good. In fact, one of them, I got a plastic bone in my face because of it. That was not a good fight. But you know what my best fights were? The ones I remember the most are the ones where I knocked people out, the ones where it didn't last more than 20 seconds. You know, those kind of things, those were the good ones. And the Bible says very clearly in here, it says, fight the good fight of faith. Not worry, not doubt. It says, fight the good fight of faith. 
that means you have an expectation. You have a confidence that even though it may be tough, even though you may be going through something, you're going to come out on the other side. See, a lot of times people are like, man, I'm just going through something. Well, don't stop. Keep going. Go through it to the other side. Now, the, the way that I can liken this to is this. You got a car. And your car is filthy. You went through a couple of mud potholes and it rained. And then as you were driving, you ran through a storm of grasshoppers or whatever bugs. And it just splattered. Well, you go to the car wash. And the car wash has a track on it that pulls you through the car wash, right? Now, would it be smart on a busy day to go into that car wash and there's cars in front of you, and there's cars behind you, and you're pulling through that thing, and you just hit the brakes. No, it would not be smart, because what would happen is not only would the thing shut down, you would get one hitting you from the back, and maybe someone hitting them from the back, and it'd be a chain reaction. Why is it in our lives, when we're going through something, we want to pump the brakes and stay in the middle of the problem? God's saying, don't pump the brakes. Don't stop in the middle of the storm. I mean, even the Bible says, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? You're walking through it. Say, I'm walking through it. Now, 1 Timothy says, fight the good fight of faith. I want to read it to you in the, in the Passion Translation because it's passionate. It says this. I love this. I think you put it up there. Yeah, look, check this out. So fight with faith for the winner's prize. Lay your hands upon eternal life, for this is your calling. So your calling is to fight with faith for the winner's prize? Laying your hands upon eternal life? That's your calling celebrating in faith before a multitude of witnesses. It's literally saying this. Now, I'm going to read it to you in the, in the New King James. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold of eternal life for which you were also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. What's your confession? What are you saying about your situation? See, there needs to be faith in your eyes and fire in your step. You don't need to be like, man, I'm just tired. It's been a rough week. I'm tired. I'm tired. You know what? We all have rough weeks, and we all have opportunities to be tired. But what is the thing that is coming out of your mouth? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Matter of fact, there's only two places, according to the Word of God, that you can find faith. We know that faith comes by praying. No. Faith doesn't come by praying. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. Now we pray. We are a church that is a praying church and we pray a lot because we know that according to Jude one twenty, that when we pray in the Holy Spirit, it builds our faith doesn't give us new faith. It builds the faith we have. But see, we have to hear the word and hear the word in order to get faith to come in, correct? And so if we hear the word, we should hear something with an expectation. Amen? 1 John 5 says this, that faith is the victory that overcomes this world. You want to overcome something in this world? You need to have faith. And you will be victorious. Amen. We're talking about the unseen. See, the spirit of faith always has a shout. The spirit of faith always has a shout. Hallelujah. The spirit of faith always has a shout. You're like, you're just trying to get me to say something. Yes, I am. I most certainly am. 
This isn't like, oh, I just don't really feel like it. Well, then just stay where you are. That's the, that's the interesting thing about God, and it's so cool, actually. He doesn't force anything on you. There's, there's well-meaning believers and Christians that, that love God, and, and, you know, they think that God's called them to a vow of poverty, and so they stay broke. That's their stupidity. There's people that, are, that get sick, and they think God's trying to teach them a lesson. He ain't teaching nobody no lesson. John 10, 10, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus says, I have come that you have life, have it abundantly, and filled until it overflows. So if anything's being stealed or stolen, anything's being stolen, killed, or destroyed in your life, it's not from God. So we know faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, but you have to get it in your heart. Amen? So here's the two places. Turn with me to Romans 10. Romans 10 says this, verses 8 through 10. But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. Two places. In your mouth and in your heart. First, it gets into your heart, and you have to believe, right? This is how we get saved, is it not? This is the salvation chapter. That if you would believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved, right? Why do we only do that for salvation only? This is for faith for everything in your life, for healing, for wholeness, for restoration. This is where we get the word of faith. It wasn't someone that someone, you know, decided to make up. This is in the word. Here it is. What does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, as if sin never existed, and with the mouth confession is made into salvation. See, you have to hear something, believe it, and speak it goes on in verse 13 it says for whoever calls on the name of the lord shall be saved verse 14 lays it out how will they be how shall they call him who haven't believed they can't you can't call on someone if you if you haven't heard how shall they believe in him who they haven't heard they can't how shall they hear without a preacher they can't how will they preach unless they're sent they can't See, there's something to this word of God that it takes faith for it to be activated in your life. You guys know me. You know I was raised Catholic, and I've heard many a priest and many a nun read this book numerous times, and it did absolutely nothing for me. You know why? They weren't reading it in faith. There was no emphasis on the word being transformative in their lives, therefore, didn't come out that way. You've got to let the Word speak to you and change you. You can't try to make it fit into your tiny box. Amen? What does fighting the good fight look like? Well, let's just, let's just hold on. Let's just believe God. Let's just have another prayer meeting. Now, prayer processes the plan of God, does it not? Prayer changes things. I mean, I can't tell you all the different times that prayer has miraculously turned things for our favor, made things disappear, made things come back to life. Prayer is amazing. But here's the thing. It's not just prayer. It's faith. Faith in the Word of God. Faith in what He says. And here, here's the key. You ready for the key on how you can have faith operating and victory in your life? You ready? Turn to 1 Peter 1. We started with it at the very beginning. It was the power of God, correct? His power, our faith. Here it is right here. Here's your answer. Here's how you get victory. Wherein you greatly rejoice. 
What? Greatly rejoice? What do you mean? But I'm really going through some stuff. I'm in a rough season in my life. What are you supposed to do? Did you guys meet me or something? What are you supposed to do? It's right there. Greatly rejoice. Greatly rejoice. It says, wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations. That means you're going through something. Anybody going through something? You need to greatly rejoice. You need to greatly rejoice. Do you know what rejoicing means? I'll get to it in a second. It's not what you're doing right now, I'll tell you that. But you're going to get it. I'm going to tell you in just a second. It's awesome. It says, knowing this, the manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith. You know what that means? It means there's a fight happening. There's a fight happening. The enemy wants to steal your attention. He wants to steal your joy. He wants to steal your peace. He wants to steal your strength. You're going through these things, but he's saying there, this trial that you're going through is producing something much more precious than gold. It's going to bring a victory. Because what you're going through, it may be tried with fire, but it's going to be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, you love, and whom though now you don't see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. So here's what you're supposed to do when you're going through a trial. Greatly rejoice. Now, if you look at the word rejoice, and it says that Jesus, do you guys remember when Jesus sent the 70 out? He sent them all out, then they came back with great joy, and they said, Master, they said that, that demons flee in your name. They were laying hands on the sick, the sick were recovering, they were casting out demons, and he says, don't rejoice in that, but rejoice that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. And then it says, and then Jesus rejoiced in the Spirit that very same hour. Now, if you study that out, that word greatly rejoice, it meant that he jumped up and down and spun like a top. That's what Jesus did. It's the very same inference right here. And you know who wrote this? Peter. We just read 1 Peter, did we not? You know who Peter is? The disciple that walked on water. Right? Guy was with Jesus for three years. He says when you're going through a trial, you need to jump up and down and spin around like a top. And you're like, well, that sounds foolish. That's exactly right. It's the polar opposite of what your flesh wants to do. But if you'll do it, you'll get over in the spirit and get the very thing you need. So Greek, I mean, literally, the, the, this word rejoice is, is kind of like um, house of pain. Jump around. Jump around. Jump up, jump bump, and get down. You didn't know they were Greek scholars, did you? They're like rejoicing, right? It's simple. But we try to like, oh, no, 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 man. Give me something different than this, man. This ain't nothing. No, God's trying to get you a key right here. The evidence of you being in faith is rejoicing. It's the litmus test. It's the truth test to whether or not you're in faith. If you're in faith about something, that means there's no way you can do it on your own, but you know that the word says that it is yours, then you have a pep in your step, you have joy in your heart, and a peace in your voice. There's many a time when Pastor Dane and I, when we were serving as the, in, in this church uh, in a different capacity that we are now, that we didn't have two nickels to rub together, but nobody could have a clue. Nobody had any idea. And it's because that we chose to believe God 
and chose to take him at his word that we were tithers and even though it didn't look good we knew that God was going to turn things around and sure enough he would just randomly out of nowhere we get a check in the mail or I would get a, a, a job opportunity or something like that and he would always be provided for but God doesn't want you living from miracle to miracle. He wants you living in the blessing so you can be a blessing to someone else. Amen? See, we can't pick and choose the parts of the word that we want to work for ourselves. Well, I just want to have prayer meetings all the time. That's great. You should. We, that would be awesome. Well, I just want to do worship all the time. That would be awesome too. Well, I just want to have healing services all the time. That, that's me. That's what I would love to have all the time. I would just love to say, hey, bring everybody in here who has muscular dystrophy. Bring me every possible disease, whatever. Bring it in here. Let's watch God heal them. I would love that. But you know what? Then I would get off. You have to have the word in every part of it for your life. And, and one of the things that it says about that is d -d 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 discipline. You've got to discipline your flesh. It's not fun. But see, when we do that, when we do what God says that we need to do, and we start to trust him at his word, and we choose to rejoice when we don't feel like rejoicing, guess what? Things start turning for your favor. Things start working for your favor. See, God put uh, gifts into the body, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, for the equipping of the body. That, that, that's part of my job is to help equip you uh, for what God has for your life. But see, what you have to do is you have to honor the word that's given. You know, we, we, a couple weeks ago, we, we talked about 1 Samuel. I think it was in chapter 20 or something like that. God says that those that honor me, I will honor, and those that lightly esteem, I will lightly esteem them. That's just a law of sowing and reaping. To the, to the level of honor that you give is the level that it is brought back to you. To the, le to the level of honor that you give to this word is the level that it will come back to you. Thank God, though, that when we do it in faith, he says that according to Ephesians 3.20, that he does exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask, hope, think, or dream. See, it, it, it's, it's about making this word a priority in your life. Say, I'm making it a priority. Nobody else can make it a priority for you. Not your wife, not your husband. Not your parents, only you. You've got to make it a priority. It's up to you. But if you will make it a priority, God will show up for you every time. Amen? And it's interesting. I love how the Holy Spirit works because the very scripture that Darnell used is the one that I was going to use today for my notes, and I think we should look at it again. It's in 2 Corinthians 9. It's verse 10. It says, now, may he who supplies seed to the sower. Say, I'm a sower. So that's, that's you, and he supplies to you through your job or whatever source of means that he, you know, you receive income. It says, he supplies seed to the sower and bread for food to supply and multiply the seed that you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. So here's what's interesting about this. You know, the people use this for tithes and offering, which we did, and it was good. But it goes even further than that. The word supply, now he who supplies, you know what the word supply means? It's, it's the word where we get choreography. It's chorigo in the Greek. And it literally means this. I want you to, to write this down. Supply is the, the Greek for choreograph, and it means this, to organize, to arrange, to supply, and furnish abundantly. So I could say it like this. Now may he who supplies or to he who organizes, arranges, supplies and furnishes abundantly seed to the sower. So he's choreographing, he's supplying, he's organizing and arranging things for you. Amen. He's working things out behind the scenes for you. He's organizing things behind the scenes. It goes on to say in, in, in 1 Peter uh, 5, 8, it says, be, be sober. That doesn't mean don't get drunk all the time, but yeah, it does mean don't get drunk. But it means be mindful. 
And then it says, be vigilant. You know what vigilant means? Watchful. For your adversary, the devil, roams around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. He may not devour me. He may not devour you unless you let him. See, the thing is, is God has supplied, he's organized things for you, but if you allow the enemy to come in, he'll steal it all from you. He'll take it right away. But what you've got to do is, you're like, hey, you're not devouring anything of mine. You've got to, remember, the, the, the faith is in two places, in your heart and in your mouth. So you've got to get that word in your heart to such a place that when any is opposition arises, when any uh, thing tries to come up in your family, in your finances, in your body, whatever it may be, you've got to speak the word out with faith. It goes on to say to resist the enemy steadfast in faith. Now I know this isn't shouting down stuff, but this is stuff that will change your life. Rewind 17 years ago I was not in a good place and I was watching my daughter and I set her in the bed and then I said she's asleep I didn't make the perimeter wide enough she rolled over I, was, I left my wife was there I left she died yeah that one right there purple white foam no breath my wife didn't go and, and run and grab some scriptures and be like oh what's this say about what does it say no she picked up my daughter and she says my daughter shall live and not die and she'll declare the works of the Lord and she's not going to die you won't steal my daughter from me in Jesus name in boom she started coughing life came back into her body just like that this is what I'm trying to get to you to have so much of the word in your life that no matter what comes your way that you're speaking the supernatural power of God that's able to raise someone from the dead that's able to change your life, that's able to provide for you in ways that no man, no job, no person could ever do. Amen? But see, you've got to resist those natural things. You've got to resist those carnal thoughts or those rebellious thoughts. As a matter of fact, uh, the Word says that you need to submit. Well, that's definitely a cuss word in church. I ain't submitting to nobody. I don't even work for nobody. Matter of fact, I quit school because of recess because I don't play. <laughs> really? Oh, so you're just rebellious is what you're trying to tell me. And yet what you're saying is I choose to reject God in that area of my life. I was one of those guys. That used to be me. But thank God for his mercy and grace. His mercy and grace is what changed my life. Because see, what you don't realize is that there's something always behind the scenes working against you while God's trying to work for you. It's not your boss. It's not your coworker that gets on your last main nerves. It's not even your spouse. I know, oh yeah, praise the Lord. Can't shout because your spouse is right next to you. The Bible says something very specific. Let's look at it. Ephesians 6. <clears throat> now when it says finally, he's like, oh God, thank you. It's done. It's over. Finally, he's done talking. That's not what it's saying. It literally is saying, hey, most importantly, if you're going to catch anything, catch this. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. 
That means when you're at your wit's end and you, you're tired of doing the same old thing, you're tired of running the rat race, you're tired of going through the same old cycle over and over again, which we've all been there and might even be there right now. What he's saying is in that moment, get your strength in the Lord and in the power of his might, not yours, because you've had a rough week. It's been hard, has it not? Well, I don't want to confess that. Good, don't. <laughs> don't confess that. <laughs> but when it gets tough, it says to be strong in him and the power of his might. Next verse. Put on the whole armor of God. See, what we have right now is we got a bunch of Christians running around naked with helmets. Picture that. No, don't. <laughs> but see, think about it. They're running around with their helmet on, but there's nothing else on. They don't have that breastplate of righteousness. They don't have the belt of truth that's able to hold everything together. Their feet aren't shot with the preparation of the gospel of peace. They don't have the shield of faith, and they certainly don't have the sword of the Spirit. They're just running around, oh, oh help me. Somebody pray for me. Um, no, you are supposed to get your strength from him. Strong in the Lord and the power of his might, and then put on his armor that you're able to do what? Stand against the wiles, the schemings, the workings of the enemy. Next verse, here it is. For you don't wrestle against your boss. You don't wrestle against your wife or your husband. You don't wrestle against fill in the blank. But it really is flesh and blood. Anything that's going to affect the five senses, that's not what you're wrestling against. But against principalities, against despotisms, powers, against rulers and darkness of this age. Against spiritual hosts and wickedness of heavenly places. See, your problem's not your problem. It's not your boss, not your friends, not your spouse. There's something behind what's trying to steal your joy. It's the enemy. How do we defeat the enemy? We choose by faith, by faith, to put our strength and draw our strength in the Lord and the power of his might. Not our might, his might. See, what you're doing is you're pulling faith into your situation. You're pulling God into your situation. Outside of that, you're doing it on your own. And on your own, you're going to come short every time. Every time. See, remember the, the enemy, the, the, it says that the, 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 the wiles, it literally means strategies and schemings. He's constantly strategizing and scheming on how to keep you down on how to keep you in a place of complacency, on how to leave you in low debar where you're lowering your level of living and just barely getting by. He wants you to walk in wholeness. He wants you to walk in peace. He wants you to walk in boldness. He wants you to walk in abundance. But you've got to realize where your enemy is. Amen? But remember this. Even though you've got all these strategies and schemings and wilings working against you, we know that according to 2 Corinthians, he's supplying seed to the sower. Now, seed isn't just financial. He's choreographing, corrigo. He's scheduling. He's appointing. He's supplying. He's providing abundantly whatever the need is. Wherever your need is, there's a seed for that. Amen? Amen? The seed could be walking in love. The seed could be choosing not to get offended and sowing love in the situation instead of strife and fighting and backbiting and all of that. Amen? I know this has come out a lot differently than the way I have it written down. But I believe that this is what God is saying to us for our present and for our future. It takes faith to overcome. 
and you're going to have a fight. But guess what? If you will choose to stay in faith and choose to rejoice greatly, I don't, I'm not asking everybody to jump up and down and, and rejoice right now. What I am asking you to do is choose to rejoice whenever you're dealing with a situation. Choose to defer to what the Holy Spirit says about your situation through the washing of the water of the word. If you will do that, you will come out on top every time. You will come out victorious every single time. Because remember, it's not by the things that are seen, it's by the unseen. We don't look at what it looks like. We look at what the word says about our situation. And the word says that if we'll trust him and we'll stay in faith and choose to rejoice when we don't want to, we're going to come out on top every time. Amen. Would you pray with me?